I welcome you uh, all to the second lecture of the course, Psychology of Emotions, Theory and Application. So, this is the second lecture of module 1. So, today we will be talking about uh, historical background and uh, in, uh, uh, and some of the basic theories of emotions. So, we will understand kind of historical background through some of the concepts of basic theories of emotions. So, before we uh, talk about today's lecture, let me give you a brief recap of the lecture 1 that we, dis, uh, uh, that we have discussed. So, in the lecture 1 we have discussed, uh, we try to define what is what are emotions and we try to see that the emotions have three major components. One is physiological component, then there is an experience part of it and then there is a behavior part to it. Then we have discussed that uh, the difference between the three terms affect emotions and mood, where we discussed that affect is the broad umbrella term under this emotions and moods comes. Emotion is more specific context oriented uh, feelings that generate in a certain context in response to a person or a situation or an object uh, and it is generally short term experience that arises. So, you may become angry when somebody insults you and it may remain for few minutes or something like that. So, it is a context driven kind of feeling that arises. Moods on the other hand are generally context free, more general, more diffuse kind of state and it generally stays for a longer time, maybe for few hours you may be in the good mood or bad mood whatever it is or it may be for days also. Then we have discussed uh, classification of uh, emotions through some of the theories of emotions uh, more specifically uh, basic emotional model where some of this model try to classify emotions as or identify the basic emotions or fundamental emotions which are universal across cultures and which are kind of innate and evolutionary and biologically based. Among that we have discussed uh, Ickman's model, which talks about you know various uh, uh, at seven basic emotions and we have discussed in detail. Uh, he talks about uh, basic emotions are anger, fear, sadness, joy, contempt, disgust and surprise. And we have discussed uh, the facial expressions and also um, in the last class associated with each of these emotions. We also discuss uh, Plutchik's wheels of emotions which also talks about around uh, about 8 basic emotions and uh, their characteristics and how these basic emotions can combine to form an advanced emotions and so on. Uh, we have also discussed Perot's primary and secondary emotions, uh, which also talks about you know uh, 6 basic emotions and uh, which are uh, love, joy, surprise, anger, sadness and fear. And the idea of Perot's uh, uh, theory was that you know. Uh, each of these basic emotion you know can lead to other more uh, emotions. Uh, uh, so, from primary emotion secondary emotions are derived. So, each of these basic emotion can lead to secondary emotion and each of the second uh, secondary emotions can lead to further emotions called tertiary emotions. So, he is uh, talking more about how can one emotion derive uh, no, many emotions can be derived from one in emotions. So, he divided into primary, secondary and tertiary emotions. So, we have discussed it in the last class. Uh, then at the end we also discussed uh, dimensional model of emotion because of certain inherent limitations of basic emotions because uh, different theories talks about different uh, you know, numbers of basic emotions and there was some uh, lack of agreement in that. And uh, because of those limitations people also some theories talked about rather than finding basic emotions, they talked about emotions should be uh, classified based on dimensions. So, one of the model that we discussed under this is called circumplex model, uh, which talks about uh, classifying emotions based on dimensions. One was balance means positive or negative emotions and another was uh, arousal. So, high arousal emotions and low arousal emotions. So, we have discussed that in that model we find found 4 quadrants of emotions or 4 categories of emotion based on this uh, di dimensions. One could be you know positive or positive balance and high arousal, it could be like feeling of joy, excitement. Uh, then there could be emotions which are positive but you know low arousal. So, it could be like calm, relax and so on. So, there could be emotions in the quadrant of negative high arousal like fear, anger, 
or there could be emotions which are negative low arousal it could be like boredom and so on so we have discussed all these things in the last class so today we will talk about specifically some of the historical background of how the concept of emotion evolved through throughout the history and we will talk about some important figures and theories that evolved as we passed uh, through the time so uh, in the today's lecture we will specifically talk about charles darwin's concept of emotions then we'll talk about william james theory then we'll talk about canon bar theory then we'll talk about schecter singer theory appraisal theories and at the end we'll talk about jejong ledox theory so let's start today's lecture so if you see uh, let us start with the historical background of how all this research into emotion came into the picture uh, emotion has always been one of the major themes of writings of various disciplines including literature philosophies psychology of course so emotion has been center of lot of writings in different disciplines you know so even theologists you know uh, has been talking about emotions and primarily they are talking about emotion in terms of emotion as passions and affections of the soul that was kind of uh, the kind of definition that was given now with the advent of psychology as a discipline separate discipline uh, uh, psychology also started talking about emotions in their in its initial days and uh, the initial focus in the research of emotion was mostly uh, psychology was looking at nature of consciousness it was looking at nature of consciousness sorry so it was looking at uh, nature of consciousness uh, physiological sensations and brain functions so these were some of the major things that were focused initially in the research of emotions so how it was experienced and uh, what was the physical sensations associated with and some of the physiological aspects of the brain also modern understanding of emotions lot of these emotions that we talk about in today's uh, literature actually can be credited or at least uh, given lot of credit to lot of earlier researchers uh, prominent among them are charles darwin we'll talk about his uh, some of these ideas major ideas william james also will talk about wilhelm wind who was also one of the pro, you know initial pioneer in psychology sigmund freud also talk about emotions in his theory of psychoanalysis we will not be able to talk about everyone's ideas because it will make the lecture very lengthy but we will talk about some of the major theories and major uh, figures in the history of emotions so let's talk about charles darwin because we cannot understand how the research of emotion has evolved without understanding charles darwin's theory or charles darwin's contribution to the theory of uh, emotions or understanding of emotions so as we know charles darwin was a father of evolutionary biology and he contributed a lot in the evolutionary sciences however many people the less known aspect of of charles darwin is that he has also contributed a lot in the field of psychology particularly in the field of emotions uh, he he wrote a very significant book uh, which is titled as you know expression of emotions in men and animals in 1872 which is one of the most significant book uh, which gave lot of initial ideas of emotions and which was taken by lot of modern researchers in emotions and still those ideas are impacting modern research so in his books uh, darwin's point out many significant aspects of emotions i will talk about some of the some of the important aspects uh, for example he said emotional expression evolved either directly from adapted behavior or through association with the adapted behavior since his perspective was evolutionary perspective he said whatever has evolved or evolved including emotions it should have some adaptive functions or it has evolved because of association with some adaptive function for example lot of emotion can serve as an adaptive function for example you may be let's say take uh, let us take the case of anger or ang angry uh, anger as an emotion so throughout evolution probably the emotion of anger have helped animals and humans to survive because when you become angry it kind of scares away your predators so it has an evolutionary function in terms of survival so that is why this emotion have evolved and passed on to generation to generation so a lot of emotions our expression of emotion survived or still we experience it one of the reason could be that you know it evolved 
directly from adapted behavior or through association with the adapted behavior. He also said that emotional expression are external representation of an internal state. Okay. So, obviously, emotion we experience internally, internally it could be stimulated by an external stimuli and it reflects an internal state uh, that you know something happens internally and it is expressed through face in the body and uh, this emotions plays very important role in communication because it it tells you what is your state of mind what that every emotion communicates something what you want if you are angry it says something to the other person if you are happy it communicates something to the other person what you want uh, or what should be done you know through emotions we are communicating um, our intentions our actions our state of mind to other person so, it serves a very vital role in communication. Very interestingly, Charles Darwin was one of the first person who talked about basic primary emotions, which we discussed in detail in the first lecture, uh, many theories about basic emotions. Charles Darwin actually talked about basic emotion in that book, uh, which are universally represented in the body and the physiology. You know, So, actually a lot of these basic emotional modern theories that we talk about are actually, you know, uh, derived from Charles Dar Darwin's ideas or at least influenced or you know, the uh, or can be credited to the ideas of Charles Darwin. In his book, Darwin also tries to ask, try to ask very significant questions or address those questions which still guides emotional research. These are still relevant in emotional research uh, because in, in any field you cannot say this is a full stop of research or there is nothing more to find out every research area is evolving. So, area of emotion is also evolving. So, a lot of this earlier questions that Darwin asked are still prevalent and still guiding the research. So, one of the questions that he asked and address is that how are emotion expressed in humans and animals? How they are expressed? And he gave a detailed analysis of, um, uh, of expression of emotions, uh, particularly through facial expressions and uh, you know, body postures and so on and so on. So, detailed analysis and uh, uh, his whatever way he collected data, you know, all these analysis are already there in his book. Second question that he tried to address is, where do our emotions come from? What is the source of emotion? Why emotion kind of from where it comes? So, in that context, Jar Darwin said that, you know, uh, emotional expression are mostly derived from habits. So, these uh, emotions are more like habits according to you know, or reflexes uh, according to Charles Darwin. So, they kind of formed. So, whenever we expressed an emotion, whenever it served some purpose, advantageous purpose in terms of evolution, uh, that got connected you know uh, with certain situations and it kind of became an habit. Whenever a situation arises, this emotion arises. So, so, this became like a reflex like mechanisms and occur whether they are useful or not. So, mostly it started with the situations where it is useful and when it becomes a reflex like thing probably it remained in generalized to many other situations. So, they can be reactivated spontaneously in situations similar to the ones that initiated in the original habit. Uh, so, originally when certain situation led to certain emotions, so those could be generalized to many other situations and a uh, lot of this situation can initiate emotions. Whenever we are in a particular situation, certain emotion automatically reflects likes, it starts. So, so a lot of this emotion you can see it happens very automatically, you know. Uh, you go in a situation, somebody insults and anger arises, you know. So, insult could be a stimulus and automatically reflects like anger uh, can arise. So, consistent with the theory of evolution, Darwin said, animal emotions are evolutionary antecedents of human expression. So, Darwin said emotions are not just the property of human beings, M many uh, animals also express different kinds of emotions. So, and obviously, animal emotions are antecedent, you know, they kind of evolve to human beings and it will become much more complex. Darwin also talked about three principles of expressions, you know, in that book. Uh, so, he said that you know the lot of these expressions are innate expression it becomes more biological evolutionary and uh, three principles are principles of serviceable associated habits 
then principle of antithesis and principle of direct action of the nervous system. So, these are the three principles he talked about. So, let us very briefly see what are these three principles of expression of emotion. So, principles of serviceable associated habits says some action could be useful in particular mental states and that people would continue to make the same movement action out of the habit when they had no use. What is that means? So, basically it says when humans or non-human animals experience an emotion act in a way that satisfied. So, whenever most of every most of the emotions whenever we experience there are some associated actions also we do. So, whenever you are angry we make certain body posture certain actions like you know maybe you know tightening your fist or something like that. So, it is an action tightening your fist whenever you are anger let us say want to you know kind of fight with someone. So, you tighten your fist. So, it is an action associated with the emotion of anger. So, an emotion ex experience an emotion and act in a certain way that satisfied it. Whenever you are angry you try to fight with someone or somebody like that to satisfy that anger. So, that to serve that emotion the action and emotion become connected. So, your tightening of fist and anger emotion becomes associated with each other you know. So, that is the idea. So, action and emotion become connected. The behavior becomes habitual. So, ye habitual ban jata hai. it becomes habitual when the emotion is present. So, whenever an emotion is present the behavior kind of habitually automatically is kind of uh, no, you, you take that particular posture automatically because it is associated with that emotion. So, here for example, you tighten up and prepare to fight if someone insult you. So, okay. so, that is what happens because both are associated. When such links are formed they remain formed. So, generally they remained like that for a long generally uh, because they are very strongly associated with each other. Emotion drives the activity when uh, even when the association action is not functional. Now, it becomes so strongly associated with each other the emotion and the ac associated actions that this actions this action can be shown by us even when it is not functional. Now, when obviously someone is present and someone has insulted you take the fighting posture posture. So, it makes sense because there is a function to taking the posture of fight because there is someone to fight with. Now, this association is so strong that when this posture is no longer useful, you will still show the those posture. For example, let us say you you know go in front of a mirror and you just imagine that somebody has insulted you just imaginary you know you will see automatically your body is taking that posture of fighting and you know facial expression of anger is coming. Even though it is just imaginary you strongly imagine a situation where you are fighting you know so that the body will take the posture of fight even though it is not functional in this context because there is no one to fight with. So, that is the meaning even uh, this association action is even not functional this emotion can drive those activities. So, because this becomes a habitual link is formed between the action and the emotion. Next is the principle of antithesis. It basically says uh, opposing mental state will result in opposing expressing behavior. So, we show different kind of emotions no, we, which we express which are associated with certain mental states. So, some emotion could be positive, some could be negative. So, so there can be some opposing emotions. So, the expression of each of these opposing emotion will be also opposite. So, if you express one emotion in certain way the opposite emotion will be expressed the opposite way. For example, disobedience is expressed through expensive gesture and forward attitude. So, whenever you are disobedient to somebody you just go and say I will not do it or something like you know there is an expensive gesture generally there may be exceptions and uh, you take forward attitude no I will not do it or something like that you know. So, forward and expensive posture is formed. The opposite of disobedience is submission when you experience in a you are in a state of submission you generally become more contracted you bow down you know, con with a bored head and so on. So, that one is expensive one is more contractive. So, opposing kind of emotions will have opposing expression. So, that is the idea. The third principle is the direct action of the nervous system. So, basically it is uh, also taking the note of role of nervous system in the expression of emotions. 
it basically says that certain actions which we recognize as expressive of certain states, certain states will be associated to certain actions of are the direct result of constitution of nervous system. So, those expressions will be also contributed by basically constitution of nervous system. So, for example, nervous systems direct action include trembling which is brought on by cold, fear, excitement or muscle exhaustion and sweating in response to fear and pain. So, whenever we experience certain emotions, nervous system will also play a role. Uh, so, we will experience certain bodily symptoms like trembling, you know, sweating and so on which are basically direct action of the nervous system. So, that is the idea of contribution of there is a role of nervous system in the expression of emotions. So, when looking for basic universal emotion in 1960s, we have talked about it in the first lecture that you know in the 1960s a lot of research has gone into the basic emotional models, people try to identify basic emotion, it was all kind of primarily influenced or derived or one of the major credit to those research could be Charles Darwin. Uh, people even use Charles Darwin method of analysis of face expression you know. Uh, mostly at that time uh, Darwin was using photographs of different facial expression and he was showing to people and asking observers to level which emotional you know this face is expressed, which emotion is expressed in which photographs and so on. So, this method was also st used in 1960s you know still used one of as one of the method. So, you can see how significant his contribution was not only on the theories even on methodology also. The two leading theories who have studied facial expressions of emotions who are highly you know influenced by Charles Darwin uh, are Carol Izzard and Paul Ekman. Paul Ekman we have already discussed in detail in the first lecture. Uh, they develop uh, their own theories. Carol Izzard also developed his theory, Paul Ekman his theories uh, also developed and uh, they had lot of commonalities with the uh, Charles Darwin's ideas. So, Carol Izzard theory little bit we will talk here. Um, Izzard, uh, talked about 10 fundamental emotions or basic emotions which are fear, anger, surprise, joy, disgust, contempt, shame, sadness, interest and guilt uh, which collectively make up a unique subsystem of the personality. So, these are some of basic emotions according to Izzard uh, and these basic emotions are innate, they develop generally in the first two years of life and are identifiable in the distinct expression. Each of these emotion will have distinct expression. Some of this we have seen in the Ekman's theory in the last class, how each emotion is associated with distinct facial expressions. So, according to Izzard, individual emotion interact with one another. So, a lot of these individually fundamental emotion can interact with each other to form other emotions. And also he said a lot of these emotions can interact with the drives other personality subsystem like drives, motor, motor perceptual system, cognitive system to create varieties of complex emotions. For example, he says, uh, for example, you know uh, the emotion of romantic love could be formed by association of drive system like primarily sexual aspect and emotional subsystem of joy and interest. So, they can combine together to form uh, the experience of romantic love and so on. So, complex combinations could be there to form all these complex different system can combine to form complex systems. Paul Ekman's theory we have already discussed in the first class. Now, uh, so this was briefly about Charles Darwin obviously his contribution we can talk you know in detail lot of other things are there, but these are some of the major things that he contributed. Now, let us look at William James. William James is one of the celebrated personality who kind of contributed a lot in the initial days of development of discipline of psychology, who contributed almost every aspect of psychological research. Uh, he also talked about emotion and gave one particular theory, we will talk about that. So, uh, what William James said, what was his theory of emotion? James claimed that physiological changes precede emotional experiences. So, what he said that physiological changes that happens in the body, the precede emotional experiences. So, he said emotional experiences happens later, first physiological changes happens in the body, bodily changes, jobi, heartbeat, breathing and so on. Uh, physiological arousal and changes happens first and then emotional experiences happens. Now, this was a kind of counterintuitive idea because generally we experience or we kind of think that you know 
it kind of violates common sense belief that uh, physiological changes are consequence of emotion. So, we experience emotion and the, it emotions changes the physiological aspect of it. Uh, William James said no, it is other way around. So, this was his idea. Uh, uh, so, he, so we generally think that I am afraid therefore, I am trembling. Uh, James will say you are trembling therefore, you are afraid. So, physiological changes happens first and then emotional experience happens. So, here physiological reaction happens first and then based on the physiological level we level an emotion. Okay. So, that is the idea of James theory of emotion. So, according to this theory emotions are the labels we give to the way body reacts to certain situations. So, certain situation happens in your life, your body reacts in certain way which is physiological changes arousal and then you level it according to the situation you know you level it with a certain emotion so first physiological changes then emotional experience so, similar idea was also proposed at the same time by danish psychologist carl lenje he also proposed similar idea <coughs> therefore uh, this theory is collectively called as james lenje theory so, basically you know both gave similar ideas. So, they are combined together into one uh, initially interestingly most of the theories are actually given by two people. One most of them are doing independent research and the ideas were similar. So, two people combined together to gave a one, one particular theory. So, we will see later also similarly two people came together to give one theory. So, this was kind of trend in that time. So, this is called as a James Lange theory. Uh, so, what happens here? in James Lange theory. So, it will say that common sense view common sense view generally says that you know an event happens okay, it leads to certain feelings. those feelings then leads to physiological changes and behavior. Okay. James Lange theory says event happens it leads to physiological changes first then at the end we experience the feeling part of it. Okay. So, this is one thing that how it is different from the common sense view. So, James Lange theory proposes that the entire experience of emotion requires sensation from the muscles and intervals. So, his whole idea of emotion is basically derived from physiological arousal. So, there has to be a sensation in the body and then there is a leveling of emotions. So, it all depends on the physiological sensations in the body. So, that is why the first physiological changes is given importance and then emotional leveling happens. So, according to this theory emotion fades once sensation decreases just once the sensation decreases in the body emotion will also fade accordingly. So, that was the main idea of this theory. One of the support for this theory was given by the people like you know when we generally people experience that when they drink wine it reduces anxiety for a lot of people. So, the argument was given according to this theory is that when people drink wine their body's physiological arousal decreases. So, sensation decreases with the, the decrease of the sensation 
the corresponding emotion also decreases. So, they are kind of uses this instance as a support th to their theory. Now, this theory has a lot of limitations uh, because a lot of people criticize this theory based on a lot of ideas. So, let us see some of the criticism of this theory. So, this theory was criticized on many grounds, uh, some of this criticism are. First thing is that there was not much empirical support to this theory, there was no kind of proper research oriented support to this theory. It was mostly based on introspection because William James uh, one of the method that he used to used was introspection. So, lot, lot of these ideas actually came from introspection rather than proper experimental research. So, uh, this was one of the criticism. Furthermore, researcher found that people with muscle paralysis in many cases where it was muscle was completely paralyzed. Uh, and with the paralysis obviously, sensation also get loss. When there is a paralysis, we do not get any sensation from that part of the body. And even after muscle paralysis, uh, people could experience a lot of emotions like joy, fear and anger. So, if this theory is correct, then they should not experience any emotion because there is no sensation from the body, physiological body. But uh, despite paralysis, people experience a lot of emotions. So, it kind of invalidates a lot of these idea, ideas of these theories. Another American uh, physiologist Walter Cannon who pointed out many specific limitations and he actually developed another theory that we will discuss late after this. He pointed out that individuals have poor ability to perceive many subtle physiological changes induced by the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So, one thing is that people have very poor perceptual ability to detect all the physiological changes that are happening in the body. So, how can the perce perception of physiological changes be the basis of emotional experience? Because we are not able to perceive all the physiological changes in the body, how can that be the basis of all emotions? In the first place when we are not able to perceive all the changes, physiological changes that are happening. So, this is one of the criticism. Second, different emotions are associated with the same pattern of physiological arousal. How could different emotions? He said most of the emotions when we experience they have similar same kind of physiological changes. Similarly, heartbeat increases maybe you know especially the intense emotions, uh, the breathing becomes faster. So, similar kind of physiological changes happen, similar sensation happens. So, how could all the different emotions be experienced based on same kind of similar physiological arousal? So, that is another criticism. Third argument or criticism that was given by Walter Cannon is that you know physiological changes depends on the secretion of hormones by the adrenal glands, glands of the body. Whenever physiological changes happens, it is generally it is done by changes in the hormones in the body. So, adrenal glands or many other glands you know secretes hormones in the blood and these hormones check creates all the changes in the body including changes in the heartbeat and the breathing pattern and so on. He said these changes of hormones are very slow to be the basis of all emotions because we experience a lot of emotions which are very instantaneous immediately we experience emotions. Now, he said these physiological changes may happen very slowly in many cases. How can all the emotions particularly the instantaneous emotion be the you know be based on physiological changes which are not instantaneous, you know they happen very slowly or at least it takes some time, but we experience emotion instantaneously. So, how can that be the basis? So, that was on criticism. So, the, all these limitations uh, were, uh, were asked or given in, in response to James Lange theory. Despite all these limitations, James uh, was it is one of the first theory that from you know at least instigated interest and prompted modern research in the physiological or uh, reaction associated with different emotion. At least physiological aspect of the emotions you know, uh, you know receive lot of attention from this theory even though there are a lot of limitation to this theory. The next comes the Cannon Bird theory. Uh, Walter Cannon as you said he, he did lot of criticism to the James Langer theory and he gave an alternative theory after making all this criticism. So, Cannon Bard actually he is also known for uh, discovering uh, fight and flight response. Fight and flight response is basically whenever there is an emergency situation or there is a threat in the environment, it is a physiological way the body reacts to a danger or a threat. So, body will either you know either the system whole system of our 
you know physiological system will either try to fight with it or run away from it just to protect itself so that is called as a fight or flight response of the body so walter cannon first discovered uh, talked about this particular uh, syndrome and, uh, and uh, uh, the, with the cannon um, uh, walter cannon another uh, physiologist philip bard at that time also kind of uh, had, the, had the similar idea so it became cannon bard theory just like james lange theory it becomes two person theory cannon bard theory so this theory claims that emotion is produced when an event or an object is perceived by the thalamus so thalamus is a very small organ in the center of the brain according to him this organ first perceives an event in the environment and then this converts this information of whatever perception that you perceive as a danger or something like that it converts this information and it simultaneously sends to the cerebral cortex skeletal muscles and sympathetic nervous system okay so three places so thalamus small organ in the center of the brain perceives an event and then it sends signal to three parts one is cortex of the brain means outer layer of the brain skeletal muscles and sympathetic nervous system so according to him according to this theory basically if you just look at it um, let's say i'm mean, just a rough diagram i'm not very good at drawing so let's say i know kind of i know roughly let's say this is human brain outer layer is called cortex so this is cortex outer layer somewhere here is thalamus is, is a small organ it is a center of the brain is thalamus somewhere it will be here thalamus so this brain and uh, it goes somewhere you know spinal cord goes through then it touches the lower part of the body okay so we'll have then this will be associated with our skeletal muscles legs and body think like this so many nerves will be also associated with our uh, no, vital organs like heart you know lungs kidneys and so on they will be as from the spinal cord in the brain the connection will go to various vital organs of the body this na many nerves will also be connected to the skeletal muscles okay. so according to this theory this thalamus in the brain first perceives an event in an environment and then it sends signals simultaneously exact it sends it to cortex the information will go to cortex then it will go to sympathetic nervous system some of the nervous system that connects info uh, sends signals from the brain spinal cord to the vital organs of the body like heart lungs and so on and also it will connect sending information to the skeletal muscles like hand leg and other muscles which are you know part of that so just to give you an idea of uh, you know some of the aspects of nervous system human nervous system is actually categorized into different parts so nervous system broadly has uh, you know different categories one is central nervous system another is called as peripheral nervous system peripheral and central so central nervous system basically uh, includes brain and spinal cord so th these are central part brain and spinal cord this brain and spinal cord is the central nervous system all the other nerves in the body are called peripheral nervous system now this peripheral nervous system also has two parts one is called as somatic 
one is called as autonomic. Autonomic autonomic nervous system. So, somatic nervous system is basically those uh, nerves which send signals to the uh, skeletal muscles where we can control. For example, I am moving my hand. So, it is under somatic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system e is connected with all the vital organs of the body like heart and you know uh, breathing and all these aspects where we do not have much control. This happens automatically. So, autonomic nervous system again has two parts one is called as sympathetic and another is called as parasympathetic. So, if you see this diagram, so basically it talks about broadly about uh, no. So, autonomic nervous system has sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So, sympathetic nervous system basically is that part of autonomic nervous system which activates the body. All the physiological arousal actually is done by sympathetic nervous system. So, whenever you feel like you know your heartbeat is increasing, your sweat, you sweating is coming in your body or your breathing, breathing is becoming faster. So, it is actually done by sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. So, it tries to cool down the body, calms, calms the body. Otherwise, uh, you know, without parasympathetic nervous system, your body will not be able to calm down. So, we generally, whenever we get activated, our body becomes activated, then our body also get relaxed after some time. So, this relaxation is done by the parasympathetic part of the nervous system. So, this sympathetic nervous system, all the physiological arousal are actually done by this sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system. So, according to this theory, thalamus perceives an event and it sends signal to the three parts simultaneously. One is cortex where it does all the higher thinking process is done by the outer part of the brain. Another signal goes to the sympathetic nervous system which activates the body uh, like heartbeat increases and so on. And another information goes to the skeletal muscles where the body moves like hand moves and legs moves and so on. Uh, all the voluntary function happens. So, cerebral cortex then uses memories of the parts. Cerebral cortex is for thinking, higher thinking part. So, human beings has this cerebral cortex which helps human being to think you know in detail. Uh, so, it uses memories, past experiences, everything it can uh, do all the processing of information and it determines the nature of the perceived event. Ki what kind of event is this you know provide the subjective and it this cortex gives you the feeling part or subjective experience of an emotion. Muscles and sympathetic nervous system provide physiological arousal that prepares the individual to take action and adjust to the situation. Canon but theory assumes that different emotion can be experienced the same physiological arousal. He said for every emotion there is not different physiological arousal. Same physiological arousal can lead to different emotions based on how you kind of you know uh, perceive an event. So, according to this theory, emotional cognitions means how do you think and perceive an event. So, emotional cognitions, feelings are causally independent of physiological arousal. So, it is not saying the physiological arousal happens and then you interpret that physiological. So, all these are independently happening according to this theory. So, even though all these aspects all occur at the same time. More specifically, cognitive appraisal, feeling and physiological aspects of emotion arise independently. So, it's simultaneously this all happens. For example, seeing a snake may instigate feeling of fear and physiological reactions such as rapid heartbeat simultaneously. So, a fear be experienced karo, heartbeat be fast ho raha hai, ek ho raha hai. It is not like one after the other. So, simultaneously it is happening. So, according to this theory, both the feelings and physiological reaction occur simultaneously and independently. You know? So, not one is causing the other, both are happening at the same time. This is how it is different from the James Lange theory. So, this theory also is also known as thalamic theory because focus is giving on the thalamus, the organ of the uh, brain. Uh, it states that thalamus in the lower part of the brain controls emotional experience. However, the cortex in the higher part of the brain controls emotional expression. So, experience is controlled by the thalamus and cortex controls the expression. 
this feeling and physical reaction occurs simultaneously. However, uh, research did not find any support for thalamus playing an important role in emotion. So, later research could not find the role of thalamus as envisioned by the canon bar theory. So, uh, sorry. So, basically this theory says an event happens three things may happen simultaneously one is you know cognition or you think and perceive about that event cognition then there is feelings happens so you see a snake and you perceive a snake in terms of cognition then you feel afraid feeling part and then physiological changes let us say your heartbeat increases all happens simultaneously and independently. So, this is what happens according to this theory. So, this is in contrast to James Langer theory because this is an alternative theory given based on the criticism of that theory. So, the ideas are very different. Uh, where James Langer theory states that emotion arises by leveling the physiological reactions in the body. So, kind of physiological emotions depend on that not independent. If this theory says these are all independently happening. So, research on victims of spinal cord injury has provided some support to this canon bar theory. So, studies have found that people with spinal cord injuries that prevented them from perceiving their bodily arousal. So, certain spinal cord injury may uh, lead to a state where you know person is not able to you know feel anything feel the bodily arousals or physiological arousals that feeling is disconnected uh, you know uh, the people with spinal cord injuries that prevented them from pursuing the body experiences they also experience actually emotions so so physiological arousal you know as envisioned in the james lenge theory you know is not directly you know necessary for you know in terms of you know, emotional experiences to happen. So, this example where you know, a spinal cord injury patient experiences emotion violates the Langer theory, but supports canon bar theory assumption that emotional experiences depends on the brain perception of an event. So, so how brain perceives an event is more important in terms of experience of the emotion. So, in this example a canon bar theory holds uh, true and James Langer theory is violated here. Again, canon bar theory also for example, the role of thalamus has not been supported in the research and uh, not every aspect of this theory was supported. Uh, both have been influenced, uh, they both have their own limitations, uh, both have influenced modern research and emotional process of the brain, particularly the physiological study and the part of the brain, role of brain in the emotion, they stimulated lot of future research. Both theory, theories have limitations and criticize for their over generalization of emotion and contradiction between theory and evidence. So, a lot of evidences are not in support of this, some evidences are there, but some evidences contradicts it. So, all these things were there and they kind of over generalized uh, their theories finding. Uh, so, canon bar theory is more specifically stimulated interest in the cognitive aspect, because it says the perception of the event by the brain. Uh, is very important. So, it stimulated research into the cognitive th th uh, cognitive theories of emotion, how mental processes or thought processes plays important role in emotion. So, it stimulated a lot of interest in that. So, the next theory is cognitive theory, we will see uh, how it talks about. So, the next theory is called Schechter Singer theory. So, all this theory uh, we are talking just to get an idea of how the various conceptualization of emotion has evolved from time to time. So, this theory is a reflection of that, how the conceptualization has changed and evolved. Schechter Singer theory it is also called two factor theory. This is one of the first cognitive theory of emotion, which was put forth in 1960s by Stanley Schechter and Jerome Singer. It is one of the earliest cognitive theories of emotion. So, according to this theory, there are two key components of emotion. Emotions, every emotion has two mo two main component according to this theory. One is physiological arousal will be there and cognitive leveling, how mind levels it. So, physiological arousal includes as we have seen 
activation of sympathetic nervous system which arouses the body like increasing heartbeat making your breathing faster and so on sweating and so on cognitive processing or leveling include interpreting the physiological arouses by looking at the surrounding so physiological arouses will be there and uh, cognitive processing will level that physiological arousal and interpret it and uh, mostly it will interpret based on looking at the surrounding and level it what kind of emotion one is experiencing so emotions are not derived from the physiological arousal as such but physiological arousals will trigger and person will level that arousal as particular emotion based on evidences from the environment so that is the main idea of this theory for example if your heart is beating faster let's say you are physiologically aroused in a situation now depending on the situation that heart faster heart beating can be leveled as different emotions so you may level different emotion based on the environment in which one is placed you may interpret raising heart as happiness if you are in a party agar a party situation mein hai the same heart beat can be called as happiness and it could be called also as an anger if you are in a situation where you are insulted so the physiological symptom is same but you are you may label it depending on the situation as an anger or happiness depending on the situation so that is the central idea of this theory another physiological arouses that often accompanies emotion determines the intensity so according to saying physiological arousal is not kind of causing a particular emotion x y z emotion but if the physiological arousal is very intense it will add to the intensity of that emotion but it is not kind of you know, creating a x y z emotion it is just influencing the intensity of the emotion but does not identify the emotion so that identification is done by the cognitive or thought processes this theory assume all emotion evoke similar physiological response according to this theory uh, canon bar theory also talks about the same thing that all uh, emotions actually evoke physiologically these are all same response happens in the body uh, but and one cannot recognize which emotion one is feeling just by observing if you just observe the body's reaction or physiological arousal you cannot say which emotion you are feeling so instead we identify an emotion as an x y z or it is a anger or it is a fear or whatever it is based on the situation of the environment so how and how do you interpret that situation therefore the difference between two emotion lies in the cognitive appraisal aspect so two emotion why an emotion is anger and why an emotion is fear it all depends on the situational surrounding so and physiological aspects only adds to the intensity of it so it cannot give rise to a particular emotion you know all all emotion uh, you know creates almost similar physiological so there is an interaction between physiological aspects and kind of uh, leveling of cognitive leveling that creates an emotion so how did they did in a very famous experiment this two person shakter and singer and that led to this they tried to test this hypothesis you know that you know so their uh, research problem was like with the same type of physics so that is one of the proposition of their theory is that same type of physiological arousal is associated with all the emotions and uh, it is the cognitive leveling depending on the situation that you say an emotion is fear or an emotion is anger or whatever it is okay so whether same type of physiological arousal could have different effects or emotion depending on the situation so if situation changes and physiological arousal is same you know uh, can people experience different emotions with the same physiological arousal so if that is proved that then theory is proved so in order to prove that they did an experiment so where around 184 male participants were injected epinephrine injected epinephrine is an hormone which has certain effects epinephrine also adrenal gland also secretes epinephrine naturally in the body also uh, when we are highly physiologically aroused so adrenal gland also whenever heart beating increases and so on so epinephrine is one of the hormones so this hormones one of the effect of this hormone is that you know it increases heartbeat you know you know it increases heartbeat and you know rapid breathing and so on so 
if this in, this hormone is injected in the body it will artificially induce those symptoms physiologically aroused you will become physiologically aroused okay so all these participants were injected epinephrine i don't know how much it will be possible in today's uh, scenario because there may be ethical issues but it was done in 1960s probably at that time it was possible so this injection was uh, you know uh, injected to all the participants and they were said this is a new drug to test their eyesight so they were not informed what is this actually injection is all about so they are just said this is a new drug that were injected to test something like eye eye eyesight or something now the this information of injection of this drug was manipulated so in two ways it was given in one group of the participant it was actual side effect what will be the effect of this inje injection it was actually said to those participants so they were in informed possible side effects of the injection like it will increase your heart beat and rapid breathing and so on okay so this was informed in another group of participant it was not informed they were not said they were just said it is a drug and uh, just to test your eyesight uh, nothing was informed to them okay so this is how the information was manipul manipulated in two groups of participant now then all these participants were placed in a room in another room room where there was another participant who was actually not a participant who who are actually helper of the experiment just to manipulate the situation another person was there in that room and these participants were placed in that room now in that experiment the environment was manipulated in one case happy environment was created in another case angry environment the mood of anger was created in that environment so these were artificially all created just to test it out their hypothesis so in case one happy environment how it was created the participant interact with, with that another person who was there in that room who was actually the helper of the participant helper of the experimenter experimenter actually put him in that room just to create a situation so this person actually created a happy and joyful he behaved in a very happy and joyful he started you know, playing dancing and a lot of things he was doing just to create an happy environment and joyful environment so in one case of the experiment it was done like this in another case of the experiment uh the participants were put in an and uh, in, in in the room where anger was manipulated so similarly another person was there in that room who became very angry because there was some task was given to all the people participants included and they were need to fill some questionnaire with lot of personal questions so this person was you know, behaving very angrily he was kind of um, with the personal questions he was kind of getting very angry and uh, he was shouting and he's finally you know tore out all these questionnaires and then went back so kind of he was trying to create an anger environment in that room so what was the hypothesis that participant will feel happier in first case and angrier in the second case if they did not know the effect of drug so in group 2 they did not know the effect of drug that there will be increase of heart beat or physiological arousal or rapid breathing they did not know anything that is the drug is causing it but these symptoms will be there in everybody one group only knew that it is because of the drug other group did not know so they did they could not explain why heart beat was increasing if because they were not aware group 2 are also not aware of why they are feeling heart beat increase but it was actually because of the drug and group 1 knew because they were told about it so hypothesis was that participant will feel happier angrier depending on the case 1 and case 2 if they did did not know the effects of drug so group 2 because did not know that heart beat is increasing because of the drug so they will try to explain why i am feeling physiologically aroused and try to explain it using the environment so according to the environment they will level their emotions so if they see the happiness is around the environment they will say his their heart beat is increasing so they must be feeling happy in case of anger they will be saying uh, they are angry because they don't know why heart beat is increasing but it is actually causing by the drug only and group 1 knew because it is the drug so they will not be they will be influenced less because they knew this they don't have to explain it based on the situation so that was the hypothesis and the result shows the actually the result came according to the hypothesis you know so uh, group 2 participant had no explanation for their physiological arousal because they did not know that it was causing by the drug so they tried to explain 
uh, find the reason of that in the environment. So, they try to level cognitively that they are feeling happy in the case 1 or they are feeling angry in the case 2. So, this is how they try to prove their concept or the theoretical propositions. So, obviously, uh, not much research later found a uh, lot of evidence. Uh, so, evidence were mixed, some found, some did not found, uh, but obviously, it gave shows this theory contributed in terms of role of cognition interpretation in the emotions. So, this has this theory has been influential and inspired many research in the field of emotion, particularly in the cognitive theories of emotion. So, if you see if you compare these three theories, so that you know because we have talked a lot of ideas in these theories. So, let us just summarize so that we can get clearly distinguish the basic ideas of each of this theory. So, in James Lange theory says physiological arousal and behavior determines the emotions. So, according to James Lange theory an event happens and then physiological arousal happens and this physiological arousal determines emotion. So, physiological arousal happens first and then emotion happens later. First physiological arousal then emotions. Canon bar theory says physiological arousal behavior and emotions are independent. He said you perceive an event then three th physiological arousal happens, emotion happens okay, simultaneously not in case of James Langer theory first physiological arousal then emotion. In this theory, theory emo physiological arousal and emotion happens simultaneously and independently one is not causing the other. Schechter Singer theory says physiological changes determine only the strength or intensity of the emotion. All emotion causes similar physiological arousal, there is no specific physiological arousal associated with a specific emotion, only intensity of the physiological arousal causes the intensity of the emotion, but appraisal or the cognitive interpretation of the event determines the specific emotion and behavior. Whether you experience happiness or anger it depends on how you level or find interpretation in the situation. Physiological arousal does not cause anger or emotion. It is if the physiological arousal is very intense the emotion will only be intense whatever that emotion is. So, these are the basic differences between these three, 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 three theories. Now, appraisal theories of emotion basically uh, came uh, uh, also uh, a set of theories that primarily talks about the primary role of cognitions or thought processes in the emotions. So, some theories came in those line also, uh, which are little bit modification of Singer and Schechter theories, but mostly they are focusing on role of interpretation. So, these appraisal theories, appraisal basically means uh, how do you interpret a situation, interpretation, explanation of a situation are appraisal. So, they talked about uh, that postulate that emotions are actually derived from appraisal. So, all emotion arises based on our interpretation of an event. So, that is the primary important thing, okay. how, how you assess a situation, how do you interpret, how do you explain a situation. So, lot of people uh, great theories were uh, theorist uh, are there in those uh, lines of research like uh, eminent researcher Magda Arnold and R Richard Lazarus are prominent names in those theories. So, the main question is that why do different people see and react emotion differently in the identical situation. So, if you see if you put three people in one situation, emotional situation, three people may react very differently. For example, let us say you put three people in a roller coaster, for one people it could be a terrifying experience, full of fear and anxiety, for one people it will be a neutral thing, for another person it will be full of joy and excitement. Same situation, three people are experiencing three emotions, why these differences? Now, they say these differences are happening because of interpretation of the event, how do you perceive and interpret that event. So, there the role of cognition comes into the play. So, the term appraisal was coined by American uh, psychologist Magda Arnold to describe uh, the cognitive processes that come before the arousal of the emotion. You know. So, cognitive processes comes first and then whatever arousal happens and other things. So, in 1960 she created cognitive theory which stated that appraising the situation is the first stage. So, for every emotional experience first thing is that appraisal happens then other things comes. 
Arnold claims that initial appraisal triggers so that appraisal will trigger both physiological arousal and the emotional experiences itself. It will trigger, but first emotion, cognitive interpretation will happen first. Physiological arousal will be there, but it will happen later. So, she recognized physiological changes in this way as crucial to the process, but not as the cause of emotional reaction. Arnold's work was slightly modified and adapted by almost similar work, but he kind of elaborated it little bit later. Uh, uh, Richard Lazarus, he developed cognitive mediational theory, which claimed that appraisal of stimuli determine the emotions. Similar idea, but he elaborated it little bit more. Uh, so, he said instantaneous frequent sometimes this appraisal can happen very unconsciously, you may not consciously determine. Whenever you see a, f a snake, uh, probably you will not consciously think ki kya karna hai, kya nahi. automatically very automatically your appraisal will happen, there is a danger. So, this can create emotional reactions. Uh, Lazarus maintains that appraisal comes before cognitive labeling. So, this appraisal before you say x, y, z, so certain interpretation happens. Uh, generating which then leads to physiological arousal and emotional experience itself. Schechter Singer theory may where it says that there is an interaction between physiological arousal and cognition. Dono ka interaction se emotions hota hai. Uh, but in this case first appraisal happens and then other thing happens. So, some little changes here and there, but the focus is more on cognition. So, according to Lazarus, cognitive activity involved in interpreting emotional context can be conscious or unconscious and it may or may not take the shape of conceptual processing. So, not necessarily all the time consciously you think about something, unconsciously also labeling can happen. He emphasized the cognitive processes govern the quality and intensity of the emotions by mediating the link between the person and the environment. So, basically uh, Lazarus talked about uh, mostly in the context of emotion, he gave lot of his studies were mostly focused on the stress and coping how do you experience stress and how do you cope with the situation. In that context, he said uh, th you know, primarily two types of appraisal interpretation happens in the context of stress and coping. Uh, one is called primary appraisal where you identify or level a situation, give importance to the situation or interpret the situation in terms of meaningfulness, in terms of importance of an event. So, you see an event, you first judge is it an important thing for me, it may happen automatically also. Uh, let us say you know, uh, so we will give an example later. So, primary appraisal first use assess the situation whether it is important or not. So, that is primary appraisal. Secondary appraisal you analyze your ability to cope with the situation. Will you be able to handle the situation because it is in the context of stress. If you think I have the necessary skills and abilities to deal with the situation, you will not experience stress much because you have the ability. But if you think I will not be able to handle a situation, stress will go very high. So, that is called as secondary appraisal. So, uh, for example, you know, let us say you are uh, going to uh, know, preparing for an interview or an examination, whatever it is. Now, let us say you primary appraisal will judge the importance. So, if this interview is very important for you, for your job and other thing, the primary appraisal, no, you assess the importance. So, you found out that this is very important for you. So, then it will impact you now. In secondary appraisal, you will see now, do I have the ability to handle this situation? Do I have the necessary knowledge and skills to face the interview? If you think I have enough uh, uh, no skills and abilities, then the stress will be much less while facing the interview. But if you think I do not have, the, I have not read much, I do not have the natural knowledge and skills, the stress may be much higher. So, this is how this interpretation may lead to differential outcomes in terms of stress and coping with the situation. Now, the last we will talk about Zezong Lidox theory of emotion. So, this is a kind of theory that gives a um, very, very uh, kind of interesting perspective to lot of these ideas. So, according to Zezang, some emotion can manifest independently before cognition, cognitive interpretation. He said, not all emotions necessarily requires cognitive interpretation as cognitive theory says. Some emotion can happen without cognition. For example, sup suppose sup suddenly there is a loud sound happens unexpectedly. We all experience fear suddenly you know so 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 but there is no cognition you don't think before thinking it happens so in such cases you know um, uh, cognition is not required thinking or interpretation is not required so additionally sometimes also we instantaneously like somebody or dislike somebody based on gut feelings you don't think much you know there is no thinking involved just in gut feeling so those cases also there is no interpretation involved in it 
So, Lidex also think that some emotion can be understood without cognitive processing like those specifically those uh, emotions which required survival like fear and ang fear probably. Uh, so, he according to Ledox there are two distinct ways to experience emotion and this is called dual pathway. Uh, one is called low road pathway and one is called high road pathways. In low road pathways there is no thinking involved like in cases of instantaneous reaction. Uh, in, in case of high road pathways you think and then emotion is experienced you know where thinking is also involved. So, according to the writing of theories, Jezongs and Ledox agree that our mental emotional response do not necessarily follow a set pattern. So, in certain cases something emotion cognition may be involved, in some cases it may not be involved. Uh, so, so, it depends on the situations. For fear for example, uh, may not require a lot of cognitive intervention in say situations where fear is arousal because for survival is at your danger. So, fear is mostly wherever danger happens. So, in those cases mostly emotion or cognitive aspects is very minimum involved in it or not at all involved. In case of other emotions such as you know uh, love where you know complex thinking may be involved and other things uh, probably cognitive rationalization is involved. So, this is the idea of this theory. So, we have seen lot of these theories and ideas. So, what is the conclusion? So, the theories all these theories all show certain truths certain facts about emotions, they contribute to our understanding of emotions. But we know every aspect of human life is so complex that one theory cannot explain everything. So, all these theories are partially explaining different aspects of emotions and uh, no theory is perfect, no one theory is able to explain everything. So, that is why limitation of one theory leads to formulation of another theory which talks about some other aspects. So, some every theory has its limitation and no theory is perfect. So, all this understanding of all these theories require and help us to gain lot of insights about emotions. So, in certain context some theory may be more valid in other context some other theories may be valid, uh, but no theory is perfectly able to explain everything and this happens with most of the psychological theories because human life is very complex. One theory cannot simply you know take account of every aspect of it. So, that is the message uh, from all these theories. Uh, so, with this I will stop here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.